All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Enfield Town Council special meeting. Today is Thursday, March 31st, 2022. The time is 5.34. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Bosco is absent. Deputy Mayor Sakala Here. Mayor Crisati? Here. Councilor Despard is absent. Councilor Finger is absent. Councilor Hopkins? Here. Councilor Ludwig? Here. Councilor Mangini? Here. here. She's here. Councilor Pisner? Here. Councilor Santanella? Here. That's four uh, members absent and seven present. Did, uh, is Doug, are you on? He said he was going to be on. So, yes. I did just receive a text from him. He's having some difficulty oh. getting on. Okay. Um, All right. So. Okay. Chief Fox, welcome. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. Um, I am Alaric Fox, and it continues to be my very great pleasure to serve as your chief of police. Uh, I also thank you in advance for the opportunity to join you this afternoon and present uh, in as much detail or as lightly as you should wish the budget proposal on behalf of the Enfield Police Department for the upcoming fiscal year. The uh, written copy of the PowerPoint has been provided to those of you that have asked for it. It is also up on the screen. Allow me to walk you through that as I believe it represents the high points of the police department budget. Uh, and of course, I'm available to answer any questions or any concerns. The 2022-2023 uh, budget maintains the department's current staffing complement of 100 officers. As you certainly know, the department, uh, when I arrived four years ago, was hovering around 93. With the council support, it went to 95 shortly thereafter. And last year, we made the decision to add in the CPO program and the one additional SRO for the middle school, putting us at 100. Unfortunately, 100 is never really 100, and I've, I've laid that out for you simply in the category I believe of nice to know. We are currently staffed at 97. We're never ever really at 100. When we get there, it's typically only briefly. That 97 consists of 84 available officers. Two are out on workers' compensation, one is in military deployment, and 10 are either in the training academy or the FTO program. Um, and that's, that's the reality of, of running a 100-person agency. I do think the 10 in the training academy is a slight aberration. We typically do not have 10 percent of the department in either training or FTO at a given time. So that that will, uh, that will ebb over time. One on military, two out on workers' compensation is, is, is pretty typical. The uh, budget that I've offered to you maintains our state and our CALEA accreditation, which are extraordinarily important to me, and I know they're extraordinarily important to you. And it also maintains what I would think of as some of the more uh, high profile areas of concern for our constituents, uh, for our community, and therefore, of course, for all of you, specifically the traffic division, the school resource officer program, the Thompsonville walking patrols, the elementary school patrols, the Powder Hollow patrols around the Scantic, the community police officer program, and the detective division. The only alteration within staffing, although it is not in addition to the 100, is the shift of one person from patrol over to the detective detective division. When I arrived, there were 10 detectives. When we reached sort of that rock bottom, tough place in terms of patrol staffing about two years ago, I had to make some difficult choices. So we got rid of a position called the detective trainee, and we lessened the detective permanent staffing from 10 down to 9. We're at a point now where I can shift that back up to 10. The detectives do the follow-up on the felony cases and the more serious misdemeanor cases. So if I shift this way, it saves over time, but we get less follow-up. If I shift this way, we're back to sort of that equilibrium. In the larger sense, the items driving the budget increase uh, are in the second slide, third slide overall that I would offer for you. Gasoline costs are estimated at an increase of $55,000. Um, that was a number that was generated, even that was generated some time, ago, some time ago. So I'm optimistic that that's hopeful, but that's part of a much larger discussion, not for the town, not for the state, not for the nation, perhaps for the world. We also have uh, a spike in terms of our bulletproof vests. We have six new that I'd be asking for because that's about what we hire in any given year, and that's what I can predict we'll see in the next year through attrition, through folks that move on to other opportunities. But we also need to replace 35 bulletproof vests. At the risk of getting wonky and getting overly detailed, here's the quick uh, explanation. About four, five years ago, the Department of 
Justice said no more on a brand of vests or a style of vest that was called Xylon. In 2018, the department had to replace all the vests that were deadlined under Nas National Institute of Justice guidelines. So in 2018, the department and the town suffered a spike in the number of vests that needed to be purchased. Vests last five years. Uh, heat, moisture, perspiration, that's as much as we get out of them. So the training officer, the quartermaster, has done a really good job of sort of scooching some of our vests from that five years ago when you replaced a whole bunch of them. We scooched some into this year. We can scooch some into next year to sort of even out that spike. But because of the discontinuation of Xylon in 2018, you get a five and, and the need to replace all of them then, your five years later, there's a huge increase in the cost for bulletproof vests. And it just, it, it's a have to. Uh, the vests are a significant increase. Just because if it wasn't for bad luck, sometimes I wouldn't have any luck. We also have six crest team ballistic vests and their helmets that have also expired. And that's just coincidental that it happened to come up in this year. That's built into the budget. We are also required to outfit 10 officers as part of a larger, larger regional team within the capital region for crowd control. This is a P, and, and I hope to never have to deploy this unit. But as part of the police accountability legislation, towns and police departments were told to stand up some sort of an ability to respond in, in a trained, cohesive manner, a crowd control function. Within the capital region, we are doing that regionally. Our contribution based on our size would be 10 people that would be trained to be part of this unit should it ever need to be deployed. We have successfully trained up our people, but we need to equip those people as well. That's an item that's driving the budget increase. We also have, uh, ha ha we have experienced, and you likely have heard, the passing of one of our canines that occurred this past weekend. It was heartbreaking. And we have another canine that we know due to age, it, retirement is imminent for that, for that canine. Um, so those are, those are two that will need to be replaced. And there are also three mandatory out-of-state slash advanced training programs where I will need to send officers because of the very specific skill sets that they have out-of-state for training. It's not training that's afforded in-state, and there's a price tag that goes with that. Those are EMT certification, uh, practical days. I'm sorry, that one is done in-state. Our explosive breacher who is one of the Enfield members of that regional crest or SWAT team. He has to be, he, he's, he's our contribution to that team. And then uh, the individuals we have that do some of the camera work will need uh, what's called high voltage recertification. I would also offer to you, uh, and I suppose it's very easy for all of us to share with you the, you know, the concept of the unfunded state mandate. The police accountability legislation of two years ago um, caused some passion on both sides of the discussion. That passion and the rightfulness or wrongfulness of feelings in those areas, the expenses on the slide before you uh, are real world expenses associated with that legislation. I'll save you the math, $272,852 in hard money in the upcoming year tied to that legislation. Um, I was a fan all along, as you know, before it became mandatory for the body-worn cameras. And those were discussions that we had had collectively. Um, so I think we were going down that road anyway. But the body-worn cameras on our Axon bill for this year, the psychological exams, the addition of steroid drug testing, the crowd control outfitting are all tallying 272,852. You will find some pleasure, I hope, in knowing that effective 1125 non calia accredited police departments in Connecticut, unless the law changes, will be required to become calia accredited organizations. And there's a lot of back and forth now in the General Assembly about whether or not that's in fact going to happen or whether it will be ratcheted down to the state standards. If that happens, have comfort that we are one of the 21 agencies in the state that are ahead of that train. That will not be a new expense for us. It would be for non-accredited agencies. 
In consultation with the town manager, we thought it would have value to simply grab an item, grab a line item, and show you the things that went into it. Um, and it was, it, it, for me, the experience was sort of uh, eye-opening as well, because we grabbed the line item, and I went to my detective division sergeant, and I said, tell me what goes into it. And he sort of looked at me and said, you want to know what goes into it? Okay, I'm more than happy to tell you what goes into it. And I got this list that had a font that was about six. And uh, it went on and on and on and on. And I said, OK, well, I mean, I asked for it, so here we go. <laughs> we have a line item, and it's a considerable line item, and it's called Detective Division Supplies. I would give you the visual of stepping into our processing bay. Uh, so patrol officers keep the lower level stuff. State police major crime squad van comes out for homicide type offenses. But all the stuff in the middle, Enfield is more than capable and more than happy to take. But there's physical evidence and physical processing that goes into that. Uh, I wouldn't use your valuable time reading this list to you, but these items and items like them are the stuff that has to be used by the detectives and sometimes by patrol, oftentimes by patrol personnel as well, uh, in terms of the day-to-day -day processing of evidence and interacting with people and, and evidence that we seize and evidence that needs to be processed. So the, uh, the font here, which is bigger than six, but not by much, this slide is actually designed to be busy. Uh, we wanted you to see the breadth of items that go into an, a, a line item, uh, as an example. When it's all said and done, uh, this, this slide for me was very telling, and I hope it's telling for you as well. I, with pride, uh, hold myself responsible because you hold me responsible for the totality of the agency budget. But in terms, and in all candor, of the items that I can control, I focus on the operating side of the budget. If Social Security or heart and hypertension or sick time buyout is, is changed, I have to sort of shrug my shoulders when it comes to that when I sit before you. But the operating expenses, I, I very much recognize, are, are front and center on me. So I went through the budget. Uh, my thanks to the captains. My thanks to Terry, uh, our admin assistant. And I said, I want to identify up what we are seeing for increases to current budget items that are just things are more expensive. I want to know what new expenses we added in. I want to know what we were able able to take out. I do want you to know that there's a calling process that we go through. If there's something that we don't need, if there's something that's not effective anymore, if there's a way that we can save, that gets backed out. When all is said and done, 84 and change plus 69 and change minus 29 and change, the operating side of the budget, I, I, I hate to use a word like only because I realize these are real tax dollars, but it's only up $124,000. Um, and that's what I consider myself, you know, very much responsible for. We were also asked to offer any ideas we had as to improve deficiencies. And this actually uh, was, a, was a happy invitation for me, because since I first arrived going back one, two, three town managers ago, there was discussion about the hazardous duty work for hazardous duty pay concept. That's a phrase we used in state service as well. It's a phrase the town, I'm sure, should embrace and does embrace for its law enforcement personnel. The town manager and I spoke about things like the court officer and the evidence officer and whether those functions could ever be civilianized because those two employees do have a foot in one world. They have a foot in the admin world, but they have a foot in the law enforcement world as well. They're handling evidence, they're processing evidence, they're bringing prisoners to court. They're going to the court and they're serving arrest warrants on prisoners that have been arrested, have been remanded back in. That one could go either way. We ultimately decided that needed to stay sworn. But I do have a function, and it's described for you in the next couple of slides, along with what we think of as a very positive proposal. I have had one to two officers. It's gone one. It's been one and a half. It's been two on occasion that perform what we would call agency technical services. That is everything from street cams to body cams to radios to in-car cameras to the fingerprinting machine to the prisoner processing uh, equipment to the cell block cameras to the exterior building cameras. It's all the technical stuff. IT will tell you, IT has told me, this is not what they do. This is not in the sweet part of their swing. It's not even in the batter's box for them. And over the past four years, we have had one officer on a full-time basis. Occasionally, I've done one plus a helper. And occasionally, I've had to go to two when we rolled out the body-worn cameras, the in-car cameras, and the new report writing system in order to simply keep up. 
the number that I really think that we need is probably that 1.5. One is too little, two is too much. I can accomplish this. I can accomplish all of that with sworn personnel. But then, frankly, you're paying a police officer to perform what is primarily an administrative function. And I don't think that's what you hire police officers for. And I don't think that's hazardous duty work for hazardous duty pay. So I would recommend to you, uh, and had these discussions with the town manager, I believe it fair to say with her consent and approval, uh, I would recommend to you 1.5 civilian positions uh, designated as public safety systems technician, a discussion that I had with the uh, human resources director slash assistant town manager as well, at the rate of $30 per hour. It is my hope that what I can find is a recent police retiree who would be willing to work either full-time or part-time for $30 an hour. One position would have benefits, one position would not have benefits. For an aggregate cost between the two of $93,600, you are keeping your police officers that previously performed this work wearing these clothes, driving cars with lights on the top, going out and doing police work. This is what we called hazardous duty work for hazardous duty pay. I see this as an improvement to efficiency. I see this as a win-win, and we'd ask your consideration and ultimately your support on that proposal. The uh, next to last thing that I prepared for your consideration was the uh, CIP needs that the police department felt it appropriate to advance. There are uh, only three, and I don't think there's anything here that you will find outlandish or unexpected. Department vehicles continues to be, candidly, a bit of an Achilles heel. There was a point several years ago, uh, a few of you were here, where the town had to make some very difficult decisions. Uh, and the state had experienced that as well. I was part of those decisions in a different lifetime. And we did the same thing you did. If everybody wants to stay employed, we got to stop buying some things. And the easiest thing to stop buying was cars. For two years, there were not cars, there were no cars that were purchased. And what that does is, it, of course, creates the ripple moving forward in the future. Because not only do you need to replace the next year's cars, but you got to go back and you got to pick up the cars that you didn't do in the previous years. The current DPW plan would call for the police department in the upcoming year to be funded to replace 21 vehicles. In the category of goodwill, and in the category of, I don't need to do it all in one year, because that also creates the problem in future years when all those cars purchased in one year age out at the same time. If we could do 17 out of CIP this year, then next year I could make up the four that I would still be behind, plus next year's allotment. So there's an ask before you in the CIP context for 17 vehicles. Uh, there are cars in our fleet, and, and I, I don't want to I don't want to sound anything other than grateful for how supportive the council has been. I thank you for that. But there are cars in our fleet that are, their best days are behind them. The second CIP ask that I would offer for you, and let me emphasize, this is not a police department radio system. This is the town-wide radio system, and it just happens to fall under me. The town-wide radio system, not the microphone, not the header that's in the car, but the equipment and the towers and, and the big stuff. Our system is about 20 years old. Our vendors jokingly tell us that if we should lose this part or that part, they're going to look on eBay for the replacement parts. So last year, the town uh, graciously, but I think appropriately, funded about one-third of the expense to replace that. $687,000 sits in our CIP account. We would ask, request, encourage a similar funding amount in this year, and then next year, the money would be available to replace the radio system in totality. The third CIP ask that I would advance to you has been the very successful Enfield Joint Operations Center. Uh, the town has been supportive of this uh, over the last three years. Uh, $175,000 and what we would do with that in this phase right here. I think that we have, I know that we have solved crime. We have deterred crime. We have solved reported crime that turned out not to be reported crime. We have developed leads in cases that we otherwise wouldn't have had. This has been uh, a crowning, a crown jewel, I think, in terms of what the, uh, what the town has supported and what the police department has accomplished. I thank you for the support thus far and ask you for your continued support. 
the final item that it was suggested that I present for your uh, edification, it's a little bit outside the budget discussion, but I know it's a, it's a source of regular concern, is simply the update as to where we are as a community on narcotics, specifically opioids, saves, and deaths. As you saw in the email that I pushed out this past weekend, uh, we lost an individual, and that is a, a real-life human being with friends and family and relatives, and, and, and that's a family that will never recover from that loss. I, I can't promise you that we'll solve this issue, but I certainly can give you the data and let you be informed as part of that larger uh, allocation of resources responsibility that you have. OCME uh, is, is advising, is reporting 73 accidental overdose deaths in town from 2015 to 2020. That's an average of 12.16. Their data is only current through 2020. 2021 is not available yet. I can guesstimate, I think, with some accuracy, but I, I need to rely on their data. So I stayed with the 2015 to 2020. Uh, it's not an even 12.16, however. It's a number that has increased every year within that five-year cycle. Additionally, uh, we enjoyed, and I use that word with air quotes around it, 82 Narcan saves in Enfield in 2021. Uh, when I offer numbers like that before you or before a community group, I, and I may have actually said this to you before, I can do the affect either way. I can say to you, we had 82 Narcan saves last year. We're great. And I can say to you, oh, my God, we had 82 Narcan saves last year. And I can say it without appropriate trepidation and fear. I, I frankly think either affect describes that number. Um, as of 2020, Connecticut as a whole, our state saw 1375 overdose deaths, uh, and we continue to eclipse the previous year. Our death rate in Connecticut continues to rank as amongst the highest in the nation. Fentanyl is present 94% of the time. Um, I'm sorry, opioids are present 94% of the time. Fentanyl is present 78% of the time. I would share with you what I would consider to be some good news for the third year in a row. And you may remember it was originally at the urging of this council. I testified before, in this particular case, it was the Public Safety and Security Subcommittee on House Bill 191, an act concerning emergency intervention by a police officer when a person suffers a narcotics overdose. This has been championed for the last three years by Representative Hall. I am pleased to tell you, for the first time, we at least got that voted out of committee favorably. Um, and this, was, this is a much more you know, in-depth discussion about what we're trying to do, but at least in summary, we're trying to take folks that have overdosed, where current law allows us for individuals that are alcohol intoxicated or psychiatrically, mental health psychiatric disabled, to subject them to what we would call a protective custody, involuntary if need be, trip to the emergency room, because these folks need care. Our law has not caught up with the scourge of modern times. With only a little bit of exaggeration and a little bit of snarkiness, we take opioid overdose, folks, and we say, best of luck to you. And I, 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 I guess I'm sorry if that sounds powerful. I mean for it to sound powerful. There are some folks that feel strongly against this legislation. Uh, I'm not holding hands with them on that issue, and we're trying to do what we can in the big picture to make this issue better. It is sincerely my pleasure to continue to serve as your chief of police. I thank you for the opportunity to join you tonight, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions about any of these issues or anything else that should concern you. Yeah, uh, Councillor Pisner. Thank yeah. you once again. Thank you. I thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you for the reminder. Um, the numbers on the narcotics just blow me away, and every time we get a notice on our computer, it's. Um, but with that said, um, and cannabis being now legal and maybe coming to Enfield soon, how are we with DRE officers? Um, I think we had two, if I remember correctly. Um, will we be needing more? We will. Uh, I, I have two. They're extraordinarily good at what they do. We are queued up for two more. 
There is a training program that's going to be made available. We solicited folks that we thought would have an interest. Uh, or we allowed folks that had an interest to express that interest, and we did a certain degree of vetting. So we're looking at two plus two, uh, given time. That is uh, an extensive training program. These individuals are extraordinarily good at what they do. You will be pleased to know that for accidents, where we believe that <coughs> intoxication by drug is a concern, the state has created uh, a fan-out, call-out system so that there is a possibility that if Farmington doesn't have a DRE, I pick them at random, on a given night, one can go to this list and say, who's got somebody who's working who can come this way? And someone from Enfield might go that way. It's also possible, and this is just a sharing of resources, this is an effort to be efficient, but it just came out the other day, that we on a given night might not have access to one of our DREs, and I might need to pick up the phone, take a look at who's working, and say, hey, Weathersfield, can you send your DRE up here? So we have a short-term plan, which is that, and we have that long-term plan, which is to spin up at least the two more. And what will be the budget impact on that? I mean, the training has to have a cost. So it does have a cost, and it is written into my budget. The good news, however, is that is state reimbursable. Okay. So there, there is actually money that's in the budget that's before you. Okay. Uh, but there is, a, there is a shell game that goes with that one. So that was part of the training in the budget? Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. And my second question is the cars. Um, everything goes through, and we say yes to that. What's the time frame? I mean, right now, cars are very hard to get. Yes, so they are. What's the time frame you think you're looking at? It's substantial. There are cars in the current budget cycle that we are still waiting on, and we are on the cusp of April of this fiscal year. Uh, there has been back order, you know, j the same way that you would have a back order and wait patiently uh, mandate, mm -hmm. if you were to go purchase personally, we are in that same situation as well. Um, and it has been, uh, that has been a challenge. I have a, my traffic supervisor sort of runs on this issue, and I will pester him periodically, and he'll give me the updates, but it is a concern. Uh, it's everything from production, COVID, microchips, processing. It's, it's the entirety of it. Um, that is no one's fault, but that is a real-world concern that is, that is, you know, that we're seeing the, the wag on the, on the tail of the dog, if you will, and you got to wait for it to all work out before that supply chain issue is resolved. Okay, and I have one more. Um, the vests that have expired, um, I know their shelf life with us is gone. Do we just, like, dispose of them, or is there somewhere else they could go and be used? So we typically do dispose of them. Uh, I would not be adverse to allowing them to go elsewhere, but I do think we need to be aware that even if our intentions are good okay. and we're offering them up as giveaways, they are expired vests at that point. And I guess, uh, I guess an expired vest is better than no vest, but it is slightly tenuous to the extent that someone would rely on it in the future. Yeah, I, can t I, I, I didn't know if there was some type of program in place yeah. that, you know, it went over, you know, I'm thinking Ukraine right now off the top of my head. I mean, you know, again, yeah. um, a used vest would be better than no vest for them. I, I've seen them so. used for testing. I've actually seen them used in the state police world. We would occasionally use them as firearms backstops, okay. where they'd be put out there as an additional, you know, rudimentary step to stop any errant rounds that might be out there. Uh, but it is it is somewhat sketchy because they are over their recommended use as a vest. Right, it's just like a car seat. Perfectly good car seat. In two years, we have to get rid of and buy yes. a new one. I get it, but I just didn't know if there was something in place. But okay, thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yes, ma'am. Councilor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mayor. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Chief Fox. It's been a very comprehensive presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I'm curious, I mean, I know the police department takes, it takes in a lot of data uh, and tracks a lot of things. Could we get that? I think it might be informative for the council and also perhaps helpful in budgetary stuff. I mean, I'd be just you know, personally curious to know, you know, have the data on, on Narcan saves, but what are the, the contacts for psychiatric issues, misdemeanors, felonies? I would love to see that if that's easily available. Um, I, a couple other questions as well. Um, do you know what uh, what the lifespan of our fleet has been? Like, what, how many miles? What are the total number? If you have that data, I would love to see it as well. Okay, uh, I actually have. I mean, I actually have. I, I only have one copy, but I actually have the fleet replacement plan. Oh yeah. Uh, with yep. me, so I don't know if it's appropriate. I, I can produce it and. Pass it around if, if that's considered appropriate. 
Sure. I, can we all get a copy after me? As long as we all get a copy. <laughs> we can give out as much data as possible, but a lot of this vehicle replacement information is why uh, Mr. Wilcox and I are still working on parts of the budget that you're going to see next week. We are trying to optimize every dollar as it comes in from CIP, potential funding, ARPA, and some other sources in order to make sure that we can strategize and use every dollar and stretch it across those three categories. So we have tentatively discussed doing some of those uh, police replacement vehicles within that fund. And it's, I, I couldn't remember, it's about six months I think we heard at our meeting that we're waiting for vehicles. So there's this whole tearing in of how we're gonna do this. So a lot of that data in terms of vehicles will come next week. In terms of other data that's collected by the police department, I leave it to the discretion of the chief as to how he organizes that data and how he can distribute it to you. Thank you both. And, and last question, this is kind of an odd one. It's, you know, it's interesting that you're over the, the, infra the radio infrastructure. I'm sure that I'm, I imagine you've had some experience with that because you've done a lot of things and worn a lot of hats. Um, do you know what the like, general average lifespan is for this kind of radio infrastructure? Is it 20? Is it less? Is the, it the number that I was given is 20, and that's, the, uh, that's about where we're at for this system. Uh, 18, 19, it's, it's, it's time. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Councilor Santanello. Thank you, Chief. Um, Thank you, sir. As, as always, it's, it's a pleasure. A um, couple of questions about the, uh, the technical service and the, the change out of, into that civilian structure. So the, the cost uh, that you're proposing is $93,000. What is the current cost to have two officers be performing that role? I would assume this is a net savings from what our current expense is. Correct. It is. Um, it, so it's a little squishy, and here's the reason why. There's one officer who's been doing this full time, all the time, forever. And if we take a look at him as a senior officer, salary plus, plus fringe, he alone is in excess of $100,000. So there's the one. The other individual is a, got himself promoted. <laughs> Good for him. And he's one of my midnight shift sergeants. So when he was a patrol officer, I would yank him off of patrol and I would put him into this function to help out when the primary individual would fall behind. Got it. When he got himself promoted to sergeant, now he's a sergeant and he's still trying to do some of that to help out while he's working the midnight shift and trying to supervise that. When I pull that individual out of his current function or his previous function, Sometimes you're replacing him on backfill overtime, so it's costing you the hourly rate of the person that comes in at time and a half, and therefore it gets, it gets hard to calculate. Certainly 93,000, which is your full-time and your part-time position, allows me to never worry about Officer 2, and it allows me to replace Officer 1, you know, the, the replacement officer would be an officer on patrol, yep. and the 93,000 is certainly equivalent to even a new hire salary and fringe, it's going to be at worst a wash yep. and at best a cost savings. And we're getting another officer on the street. Correct. Full -time. Correct. It's, it's giving you the officer that you're hiring as an officer to be an officer. Right. Okay. Um, question about the vehicles. Do we buy them or do we lease them? Or maybe this is for the town manager mm -hmm. and for Mr. Wilcox. I, I don't know. What, how do we... Um, for the past few years, we've actually been leasing them. Um, we've had about, I think, like four year, four annual lease programs. Um, we've not ever leased, well, last year we leased like 10. Um, prior to that, I think it was six or seven vehicles each time. Okay. So it, we have been leasing a lower number of, of vehicles. Right, okay. I mean, I, I just, I, you know, clearly these vehicles, I, I mean, I've been uh, a guest uh, and seen the condition of some of these vehicles, and, and, you know, they're obviously very important pieces of equipment, but, um, you know, we need to, we need to kind of 
preserve the spikes and the peaks and the valleys in the budget. And I, I, I hope that we can find a way to um, find a blend of CIP ARPA funds to smooth that out so that for the foreseeable future, we are consistent in the way that we replace these vehicles in a, in a timely way. So I'm, I don't know if the town manager has, you're still working through that, correct? Okay, and that is part of the plan, is to use ARPA funds to some extent to mitigate these peaks and valleys down the road. So it's supposed to be for one-time use, transformational issues, but for the new final rule, which allows that $10 million kind of um, free pass, so to speak, we are trying to analyze the pieces of the budget where we can actually get ahead of the curve. Right. The vehicle replacement schedules across a couple of different departments are one of the target areas that we're looking at. So, so we theoretically, and this is just theoretical, we can use ARPA funds for this budget year for some vehicles, potentially some ARPA funds next budget year, and then CIP year three, and so on and so forth. Or a mixing and matching mix and match within those okay. years. So, All right. And that's the that's the plan. I don't need to know what the plan is, but that's what you're looking at. Well, today. I'm glad because we don't know what the plan is. Okay, that's fine. So, well, I trust you. But um, <laughs> we are, the finance director has recommended that some of those ARPA dollars be held for yep. the next fiscal year. And so we're working through some of those parameters so that when you see the final product, it has a lot less what ifs in it. Very good. Okay. Um, that's all that I had. Thank you very much again. Thank you, sir. Okay. Councilor Finger. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, Chief, I don't know if you can answer this question or maybe the previous council is, I haven't seen your proposal or your budget thing. Um, what happened to the deputy chief position? I mean, to me, that was a position that was very, very important in this town. It was a, uh, it was held by some very, very, very good people. And um, it, was, it, was also, it was also held as a promotional step towards chief. We've had, you know, like Chief Sparrows and the Chiefs before them, you know, they went through all these steps. They went from, you know, the street walker right up through the Lieutenant Captain, you know, Sergeant, excuse me, Sergeant Lieutenant Captain, you know, Deputy Chief Chief. And I don't see that. I mean, why aren't we pushing to get this position back? I mean, in my opinion, that is the most important position besides yourself, of course. <laughs> And um, and all the other officers, but I mean, I, I I just don't get it. Why we why are we not, why don't we have that? We've had this in this town for years, and we and we don't have it. What happened to it? We can't answer it. I'm okay. Maybe some council, some previous council members can answer for me. Um, but that's my question for tonight. Thank you. I would tell you only that the council made a decision approximately two years ago to uh, eliminate that position. Uh, the why behind it would probably be answered uh, better by you folks. And, uh, Councillor, I very much appreciate you wearing that shirt. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all it's I have. A, it's you. a Toys for Joy if you had it. Oh, okay. yes. You got it. It's meant to be humorous. Councillor Mangini. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Ludwig, I'm sorry. So, so I know you're do, doing parts of the budget, Chief. Just what's your overall budget increase, you know, including salary, overtime? And just if you could touch on the overtime compared to prior years, I know we've talked about in the past, and you know, what will be when you, you know, we get the overall budget. So the, the operational side is the 124. Yeah. The overtime that we included was based on an average of the previous three years. Uh, I can tell you that our overtime was up last year, uh, or the current year, I should say, and it was the, re and I'm very appreciative of this, but it was a result of the five positions that were added in right. and the need to put the people in those positions right away. Those five people came out of the patrol function. So we had five less patrol officers because we had the four CPOs and then the fourth SRO. So that spiked the numbers up. Uh, I can get you the total number for, for this year. I don't have that before me. I do have the ask for the upcoming year. It should be the case that over, and it will be the case, that overtime drops as staffing right, is more right. robust. That's what we talked about. Um, but, the, you know, the town has also, and again, very, great, very, very grateful for it, the Thompsonville walking patrols, the concerns that have been expressed to you and we're just about in the season. That's the a separate line item, though, isn't it? Well, that was a separate line item. It is now going to be added into the overtime right, so budget. That, okay, but it was a separate item. Correct. Right. But that, but in terms of like looking at the number that you're seeing here, please understand that for this budget, that item has been added in. Right, right. 
Scantic. Uh, we're just about in the season, the Powder Hollow season, where the residents in that area and visitors to that area, um, sometimes there's a sometimes there's a clash. Uh, and, and you've been supportive about allowing officers to go there to try to deal with it. The SRO overtime patrols, I think, was a tremendous decision on the part of the council, but that's an overtime cost. Um, I have got, uh, and I guess I offer this merely in the category of you knowing that I'm looking at it, I have got, again, in my binder, an item-by-item item breakdown. When somebody puts in for overtime, it has to be coded and it has to be explained and it has to be signed, has to be approved by a supervisor in advance and signed off on the overtime slip. I get that report and it breaks down into every individual category. Well, that's the answer I want to hear because you know we, we 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 put this in a few years ago just to make sure that that it was being tracked. So I appreciate you saying that because again I think when we had this discussion we were concerned that you know not that it's not important of course it is but. We still should be able to justify. Yeah. All right. I, I don't. I don't know if this is the forum, but I'm more than happy because I. I mean, I've yeah. got it in. A, I've got it in an Excel spreadsheet. Whatever, yeah. If you take whatever. If you want this part of your overall, when we get the overall budget, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And then, right. so the 250 for the SROs is including the budget for the for the. SROs for the schools for the overtime. Yes, that would be that, that would that, be. That, is that a, that's an overtime part of the budget? Correct. Okay, right. So yes, that's sir. Included in your budget. Yes, sir. Okay. And, um, and how generally, how, I mean, I don't know if you want to say how off, are we close to what the numbers we wanted? I know we haven't had a public safety meeting, but. We, uh, yes. We, an average? We, we staff uh, what has been requested by the town at a minimum, at a minimum. Yeah. 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 And uh, more accurately, we staff at the maximum level whenever we can. Perfect. Thank you. Um, sorry, one second. So, so do we, when, as you know, when you send me the, uh, the NAR can says, so I'm not giddy to what you were doing, but obviously any life save is important. And it gives them a chance to maybe, again, take a turn, right? So I think it's, again, it's one of those good things that I think we do that as an officer and an EMS person that they don't get the, you know, the, the credit that they deserve. Do we track, so when you say someone goes to the hospital or seeks treatment, do we track that as well? And, you know, it's hard, but I mean, saying like, you know, out of the, the ones that we've, you know, you said that they go back into... But some don't. Some are actually yeah. seeking treatment. Are we tracking that? I, I would not have. I would not have a mechanism to do that. I'm afraid. Okay, I, I mean, they, they go for care. They don't go for care. I'd like to think that some that say no subsequently go for care, uh, and I know that some that go for care uh, don't go any further than the emergency room before they decline to go any further. The level of success that they have, I, I would. I don't know that I would be privy to that. I will I, tell. I know. I, I know that's. And when I when I see when we see an email that. The individual decided to go to the hospital. Yep. It's always that there's the light that you hope maybe changes the direction for that person. Correct. And I will I will proudly tell you as well that in conjunction with social services and uh, Ms. Guerrero and I work I think very well together. Every one of those saves is also forwarded to her right. with the details as well. Right. Um, you know, in an effort to be appropriate, respectful, and polite, you folks get a summary. She gets the email with the name and the date of birth and the address so that her folks can follow up right. for individuals that might be recalcitrant uh, at scene. Yeah. I, again, I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I really do. Is we've had this conversation. With the lease packages, just curious. Now that we're behind, so again, you can't buy, vehicles are scarce. At one point, is does the lease package, so if we've, so I know, John, say you went out and leased for 10 cars back in September of last year. We still haven't gotten them. At what point, you know, from a leasing perspective, do we, does that, I mean, we don't get the cars, right? Do we have to, how does that from a budgetary standpoint work? If, if we're not going to get these leased 10 vehicles, do we pull out of that lease and then we decide to try to buy something locally or something different? Just curious if we have, if we have to actually have a, do we have a process? Now that, you know, we're struggling, and again, I'm not saying we shouldn't lease because we should, but if we're behind six, seven months, does there come a point where we say we got to try something new? The way the leases work um, is it, it's, we get, yeah, I know you, uh, so you, we get, you've been so, on the package, right? Right. We, yeah. we, we, um, we do an, issue yeah. an RFP. Um, let's say we're going to buy $600,000 worth of police cruisers. Okay, we'll tell them what we're what we're buying, the length of the lease, and we request the best interest rate on the lease because that's that's really what is is driving the cost of it. So once we award the lease, 
they create what they call an escrow account, which right. is basically they put money aside. We then go out and buy the, the cars. Once we get the cars come in and we, re we receive them, we get the invoice from it. We will pay the invoice, submit that invoice, or maybe we will submit the invoice directly to the leasing company who will pay the vendor for it. Okay, so we actually kind of go through two of the bidding process. One bid for the lease. We also, typically we buy the cars off of a state contract. Right. Um, but once they come in, um, we, we, they usually the, the, the leasing company will pay the vendor directly. Sometimes we pay it and then get reimbursed for it. The um, typical duration of that um, escrow account is one year. Okay. All right. So once that, if, if you don't spend the money within a year, they will have provisions in the lease uh, where they apply that balance to the payments. Um, <clears throat> so we obviously, we had a, a few issues, not, not really issues, because we had to work with the leasing companies, and they were very helpful um, during COVID because everything was right. delayed, and we had... Um, we had at least one loader that uh, that took a long time to come in, and it was and it, so basically it took us a little while, and they were they were more than understanding with that, um, <clears throat> but typically the um, the length of time is like one year for those. And then at that point, what does does that, does that just go back into our capital budget? What we don't if we don't spend any leasing package, right? That's where that. The leasing package, we budget, we, we don't right. actually budget for the lease itself, or I'm sorry, the capital itself, we budget for the lease payment. Right. So once that was finalized, we have what our total lease payment will be, that goes into the uh, into the debt um, section of the general fund budget. Okay, all right, thank you. You know, Chief, just uh, one last question. You know, you know with the fentanyl stuff, you know, I think, you know, it's sort of like, you know, we were chatting about some of the human trafficking and things. I think there needs to be at some point, you know, again, a presentation to, re to educate people how they And again, I know you're probably saying everyone should be educated on the dangers of fentanyl. But I don't know if people really are, how dangerous fentanyl is and how unfortunately prevalent it is in our community. You know, and I really do think that's something that we should think about to have a presentation at some point because it is is getting way too common, unfortunately, and almost... I hate, I hate to use the word common, but I think that's the correct word. And I know you can speak better than I am. But I really think, I, and I agree with you, it's, there's maybe, there's only so much you can do at the very least. I mean, this stuff is, you know, we're opening up a brand new middle school next year, and every drug is bad, and this one's badder than the bad. And I, I would rather have us be on, as it, putting out education, even if it's you coming for the council, giving a present, or someone you would recommend, like we did a few years ago when we had, we had the FBI office here. I really do think it's important because it's it's scary when I see when you give us those things and it's a fentanyl bust. I mean, I, you know, and then I know you can't talk about it, but what happened about a few weeks ago? I don't know how that's not attempted murder when someone, if you knew anything about fentanyl, when they blow it up into the air, it can kill anybody. And it's just amazing to me that this, you know, for me, I'd like us to be more on educate so people realize the dangers. I don't really think people do understand, which is. I think, because again, everyone knows heroin and opioids, but it's the fentanyl stuff that's scary. I mean, not that that's not scary, but you know what I mean. There are very few uh, items that are reported to me at this point in my career that cause me to go, oh my. Right. That event. I agree. It, it, me I can't to go, believe it. Then, um, oh my. No, it's a whole other argument. I'm not going to get into the whole bonding issue, but I mean, when you reduce the bond when that happens and we're spending local tax dollars like we are as we should to protect our community. I got to tell you, it, it does, it scares you. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not telling you because I know, but I think, but those things, I think the only way we can counter is to let people know, look, this is what you look for. And if you see it, do, you know, because I think it, it is, it's, that stuff is, is dangerous stuff. I, uh, I appreciate that. I, I wholeheartedly agree, and I'm, I'm more than happy to do whatever whatever the council should want at whatever point in the future. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I also have a document uh, that I don't. I only have one copy, but if it would be of help just for you to see it, I have the overtime code document. If that's something you want to look at, 
I mean, when we get the overall budget, that's fine. I was just, I mean, you know, that's. Yeah, fine. I'm sorry. This this was the one that had the individual breakdown based on categories. I so love if to say anything. If you, yeah. yeah. Well, sure. It's appropriate. If it just gives you. Thank you. Some degree of solace. Appreciate it. Being looked at. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it, Chief. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Mangini. Thank you. And thank you, Chief, for a wonderful, dynamic presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Always behind you. You are always direct to the point, and you never ask for anything that you truly do not uh, believe is required. So thank you for that. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One, have you applied for grant funding like we used to apply for the COPS program? I know at one point they did away with it. That's question number one. Question number two, again, you know, you and I spoke before in the complaint. Mounties, crowd control, has that issue come to the forefront for you as a professional? I don't know if Enfield is in need of this type of um, security, uh, but I know many cities are using, you know, horses, uh, and and a lot of our um, criminals are afraid of horses because of the size. So I wonder if you could speak on that issue as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, on the first issue, while. While we have not, uh, perhaps in the first year that I was here, we were eligible for a COPS funding grant opportunity for effectively a new body. We put in for that, it would have been four years ago, it was, it was not favorably received. Uh, when those grants are available, frankly, uh, they are more often than not going to more uh, financially distressed larger cities. I do not know. I do not know of anyone, even close to the Enfield level, that has received funding for the addition of one or more officers through that cops money. Uh, you know, in the in the mid 1990s, late 1990s, cops more, cops now, cops fast. Those were the three programs, and they were we were going crazy with them. Uh, there was a great deal of DOJ money. That money is not anything that we're privy to at this point. Please do know our DUI money, our DUI enforcement money, both roving patrols and spot checks, our click it or ticket money, the Axon body worn camera reimbursement money, some of the JAG grant funding that we get from the state, all of that, all, those, those, those smaller, I guess I would call them day to day grants, we actively pursue them uh, and with success. Um, but the the cops grant for the you know for the payment of the body that's not I, I would I would not have any optimism that we would get those. Um, and then in regard to your second question, I'm certainly amenable to any additional tools that the that the town would like me to consider. Uh, we do know that mounted programs have a considerable spin up expense to get things up and running. Uh, but I certainly. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk to the town manager or the council, as you folks should see fit, about uh, ultim ultimately, <laughs> ultimately about how you want your police department to be run. I'm, uh, I'm the shepherd, and I'm happy to be the shepherd, but ultimately you folks own the flock. <laughs> well, thank, well, thank you. you. I, I, I do appreciate, appreciate you addressing, addressing both questions. questions. Thank you, And again, thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chief, I, I just have a couple of comments to make. First of all, uh, thank you for your very professional uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, and looking at the budget from, you know, 2022 to, you know, the current budget and, you know, only an increase of you know, a little over $100,000 is very On the modest. operational side, yes, Yes, sir. on the operational side, it's very uh, modest. Thank you. Um, so I'm very... Um, you know, impressed with, with everything that you have here. I, I do have a couple of questions that I just want to mention. Um, can you just uh, talk a little more about the uh, the body-worn cameras, uh, shelf life of the, the camera? I know you have it down here that costs annually for even the in-car. Can you talk a little about that? Sure. So if I take you back in time to a little over two years or so ago, 
the police accountability legislation obviously uh, uh, flowed from many larger national discussions that we were having. And one of the pieces that Connecticut mandated was the, bod the, the body-worn cameras. Uh, at that point, we did not have body-worn cameras. The legislation also mandated in-car cameras. Our in-car cameras at that point, uh, hodgepodge would have been the word that came to mind. So we, uh, we dealt with multiple vendors. We assessed their products. We beta tested a number of them. Um, and the vendor that we went with, Axon, uh, frankly, uh, I, I don't work for Axon. I don't plan to work for Axon. Uh, they were clearly the best choice. We are uh, pleased with the product. There are bugs that have to be worked out here and there, as I would expect with any piece of technology. We are on a five-year payment plan and cycle with them. Okay. So the $248,000, whatever the dollar amount is for this year, is one-fifth of our commitment to them. At the end of five years, we will be at the roughly the end of the shelf life with these. And then what I would anticipate would be a conversation with them where they would replace everything we have and we'd continue down that road. I suppose in theory, if you were doing your own storage, which is not a business that we want to be in, you could have cameras and you could break away from a vendor and you could do your own storage, I guess, but it would work only until the, the system began to fail and the cameras began to fail and you reach storage capacity. What I imagine is that three years from now, when these are at the end of their life, we'll have to sit down with Axon and have a discussion with them about effectively renewing or refreshing, uh, reinvigorating the contract that we're under. I, I would assume under similar terms. They've been good to work with. All right, great. It's, it's great to hear that you, you have a, a plan intact, in and you know it's every five years. So. It's been a positive experience. I find them to be. I find them to be a very, uh, very worthwhile vendor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. The second one um, is the vehicles for the dogs uh, in your narc narcotics section. I believe there was one new vehicle that w that was purchased a few years back. Is there a need for another one? So we are. Or is there plans for another one? Hmm. Thank you. So we are replacing the vehicles as part of the broader. What are the cars that are oldest right now? And when the cars that are oldest that need to be replaced happen to be a canine car, then that canine car is the one that comes up in the rotation. Uh, I do have enough canine cars for the canines that we have at present. I. At present, right. I have more vehicles than I have canines. Um, but when, uh, when a vehicle is ready to a trit out, that vehicle is replaced, whether that is a patrol vehicle or whether it happens to be a canine vehicle. To do it to the contrary might cause me to replace a canine vehicle that might be in need of replacement, but perhaps not as quickly as a patrol vehicle that happened to be older. So there's an element of this that has to go into it. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, appreciate that uh, in, in clearing that up. Uh, I definitely like your the idea of the CIP budget, your, your three phases that you have here. I'm, I'm in total agreement with that. And I even like the idea of the, the civilian positions that you are going to be offering. I think that's a it's, a it's a great idea to have retired officers that are trained and, and doing what they need to get done to help out the department. Thank that you. Would, that would free up uh, your other officers to be on patrol. Thank you. I, I see it as a win-win-win, as a and I appreciate I, so, even so, that preliminary so don't support. I, and, I, and I think it's a fantastic idea. I think $30 is not enough, to be honest with you. But for starters, I think it, that's just fine. Um, and then the last thing that I just want to uh, mention uh, I just want to commend you uh, in testifying because I am in a, agreement uh, in regard to a, a person that suffers a narc narcotics overdose that, you know, they have the, they can refuse to go. I think they have to go. And, uh, you know, so this involuntary, uh, uh, you know, thank you for thank you. being a champion for that. The issue really is, in, you know, in a world where we're asking, uh, cajoling law enforcement to make better use of social service and mental health providers. Here's the perfect instance where it clearly is needed, but the tool 
to get this individual into care isn't there. And that strikes me as ironic, especially to the extent that current law allows that tool to be there for alcohol situations or for psychiatric disabilities. This clearly is an example of the law simply hasn't caught up. And there's some concern in some quarters. Um, but uh, my response is that statutorily, these folks technically could be arrested. And nobody is doing that. No one wants to do that. And I'm not going to countenance that. But please give me the tool to root people to that mental health, right. medical, social services care that might help them break that cycle. Right. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, once again, I'm very impressed with your, your department and your leadership, uh, second to none and also the uh, CLIA accreditation. And I know that the state is going with that silver standard instead of that gold standard, but w we have it here in town, so that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep, Councilor Santanella. Can I just ask a follow-up? Because I just yes, got this um, overtime report. Yes, sir. I, I, do we have enough <laughs> officers in your department? Is, is, is 100 the right number? I believe that it is. Okay. I believe that it is. A, just, a lot of what you see yeah. is uh, you know, three weekends ago, four weekends ago, there was an individual that was arrested that legitimately needed medical care. It was a Friday. The person had to go to the hospital, and they got admitted. And we had to babysit that person for the entire weekend <clears throat> because they couldn't come back to us, and they couldn't be cut loose. There was a court-set bond. It's an overtime expense, and there's just no way to avoid that. Um, there are uh, staffing responsibilities that are obviously paramount. Uh, I do think I do think a hundred is a good number. Uh, <laughs> certainly, a hundred actual bodies at work is a good number. Eighty-four. Eighty-four can be a challenge sometimes. So I'm, I'm I don't have any of the background. Maybe somebody can help me understand like what the impetus of creating this report is. But I think it's incredibly helpful when you look at some of the categories of why they're where the overtime dollars are going. And when you see hundreds of thousands of dollars in shift coverage, and you know what is the is that people calling out sick? Is it that we don't have enough people? I'm just I mean, if anybody can shed yeah. some light, could, would you mind? Yeah, I can, I, I can I'm answer curious. The question. And I think it's not just chief. It's for we did this when we got cut eight million dollars from the state budget, and we were trying to stay afloat. And basically, we were just asking if you're going to need overtime. We changed the process to say to what you see yep. is okay. Here is why we're doing the overtime. And it wasn't just police. You know, it was every department because again, we got cut eight million dollars, and we were trying to keep the town going <laughs> forward. And so we tried to say, look. We're not saying we're against overtime, but we needed to make sure that everyone had a say to say, okay, is that so? For example, I remember one weekend we had a you know, we had really rainy summers now for the last five years, it seems. The one we had a rainy, you know, baseball games got canceled and the fields were a mess. We finally got a great weekend and we said, you know what, we want the kids to play, let's, let's approve overtime. Yeah. So it was a way of having accountability and in and, and the, and the sort of the agreement with Chief and the department heads is that, you know what, if you come back to us, and he has to go in public and say, I need a hundred grand because you're telling me there's issues over this part of town. I need to do X, Y, Z that we weren't going to, you know, rip him in public for asking that question. So that was sort of the, the gentleman's or the mutual agreement that we were going to show them the respect if they actually came and needed it. And us, we were going to manage it tightly because we got cut so much money. I guess this is a great tool. Yeah, I think he, this he, is just a great tool. He did a fantastic yeah, job of it. I, yeah. This is a great tool just to be able to kind of understand, you know, where yep. staffing issues may arise. I, I think this is great. So thank you. Yep. Thanks very much. I appreciate the explanation. Yep. Well. Appreciate the question. Okay. I have, sorry, one quick question. I'll be done. Yeah, sorry, Councilor Ledwick. Yeah. Done. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, you, you prompted a question. So that when, what does there come a point? Because I think the supply chain issues aren't going to go away. And I'm assuming every department in, thank you, you know, in in the country who's probably looking for if they're looking for vehicles has maybe a backlog like we do at what point do we pivot is there a way of getting local vehicle i know they're special these are specially you know ordered vehicles but does it come a point where if we have some of that money that not as least and we you know went back into our budget do we look at used i don't know if there's such a used market out there i'm just saying temporarily because i i don't see the supply chain issue going away and if you're right if we have a car that has a two hundred thousand miles on it is it some of that money we're saving or, or coming back into the budget because we can't lease brand new vehicles? 
do we is there a secondary market that we can look into? I have never heard of a secondary market other than you know perhaps very rare instances where you know almost a non-police function is being utilized okay, for those I didn't cars. Okay, know if that was the I mean I've ne no I never seen I mean, most apartments right. take their cars um, uh, we used to put about 30,000 miles on a car per year in state service yep. we tried to keep them for this, I'm just using this for the larger analogy yep. we used to have them on a 5 year lease cycle so we knew that I, I had 1500 uh, at the high water mark it was about 1800 uh, four wheel vehicle you know total in my responsibility so I needed to replace 300 vehicles right. per year on a 5 year cycle um, sometimes the math just happens to work out exactly that easily. So the cars that are coming offline, I, I think anywhere in Connecticut or probably anywhere in the nation, are coming off in the neighborhood of 150,000 miles. Right, yeah. is, it, is it more appropriate to buy rather than lease to deal with a local vendor instead of an MHQ? I'd, I'd need to defer to Mr. Wilcox. I mean, I know we were all into leasing, and it made sense because it, it stretched our dollar. But if there's going to be a supply chain issue, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not just throwing it out there, John. I don't know if there's anything else because I just don't see that going away. Well, one of the things with that, the leasing programs is that puts a lot of stress and a lot of uh, work in, in our department right. to track all the invoices, make sure we're getting reimbursed for everything, and get the lease payments out. Um, but it did stretch our budget and allow us to buy more vehicles right. for a number of years. Um, the, the problem that I, I see is the delay in the vehicles coming right. in. And that's where I'm concerned about leasing in the future. Yep. Uh, at least, I agree. I at agree least with yeah. the next couple of yeah. years. So, I mean, we were really actually planning on purchasing them. Okay. Um, from the vendor standpoint, I mean, for the police vehicles, we typically use MHQ, <clears throat> once again, off a of state contract. So they get paid regardless. To them, it just looks like a vehicle that was purchased. They don't really care who writes the check for it. So um, that's where I was leaning towards. Um, you know, it's just the putting together the, the number of vehicles in... in relation to the overall um, requirements of the town. That's what we're... No, I, it's amazing that we were... Leasing made so much sense a few years ago, and now, I don't know. I mean, if we're not getting vehicles, I agree with you. And I know it's a ton of work for your department. And, there, and of course, the police aren't getting the vehicles. It seems like, you know, we're kind of spinning our wheels, so it might not be a bad idea to temporary, even if it's temporary, to change. Right. Well, I don't even know that... Yeah, you know, if we were going to purchase them outright, whether that would change right. the That's delay That's true, too. Well, good point, yeah. right. Yeah. They're in the budget. I mean, the money's in the budget, but it's still whenever MHQ gets the vehicles. Okay. Uh, we had a similar issue with the uh, chassis for the ambulance yep. uh, last year. It took a while for that one to get in. Yep. But. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Chief. Greatly thank you, appreciate sir. it. A motion to adjourn. Okay, motion to adjourn. Whoa, 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 whoa. I still have one question. Doug, thanks. My hands been up. Can you guys hear me? We hear, we hear you now, Doug. Uh, yeah, my hands been up. I've got this little yellow hand in the corner. I don't know if you guys can see it. We didn't see it, Doug. That's why. It's real quick, Chief. Chief, I, and I know you're focusing on a lot of things, but um, the training, the shooting range down below at the uh, transfer station. That is a, uh, in my opinion, a work of hard work between the uh, DPW and yourself, trying to get something there. Long range shooting with the rifles, it's, it's going up the hill, it's a crap. Have you had any intention of trying to improve that center or, you know, that fire range, or is there something in the budget we can do to help to get that to be more efficient for the officers? I mean, this is, this is if anybody goes down there, I don't know, people say they've been down there, they have. You have to go down and see what your officers are trying to train and shooting their, their new nines, their long range rifles. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a little toy land to what they, what they really need. They, they need something that's more professional for themselves. Have you, have you thought about that or something in the budget for that? I, I promise we did not rehearse this question ahead of time. No, we did not. Trust me. Go ahead. <laughs> so for the edification of the town council. Today, the state bond commission did meet 
and there were several items approved, one of which was the bond authorization for the public safety complex. That was the subject of your referendum last November, which did fail. Uh, but now the funding has been guaranteed through this bond vote. So it is going to be a policy matter for all of you to discuss in the ensuing months about how to handle that. And for those of you who probably remember far better than I, since I wasn't here, that does include a state-of-the-art range that would be incorporated into that public safety complex. That, along with several other components of that proposed facility would have a regional aspect as well, which could in some cases garner regional cooperation, uh, enhanced training, but also potential revenue opportunities as well. So that's a, a, a discussion item for your plate for the next few months as we march toward those deadlines for referendum issues. Thank you very much, Tom Andrew. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief. And no, this was not rehearsed. I just see it every time. I see these guys down all the time. It's, it's just, it, it is a disgrace to our, to our Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Councilor Smith. Motion to adjourn, please. Second. I'll Co second. Councilor Hopkins. Second. Enjoy the pool, Cindy. Adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>